welcome to the Surfcast Podcast, your weekly source for surf fishing discussions, tactics, interviews, news, and more. The Surfcast Podcast is hosted by Jerry Adet and Toby Lipinski, two of the most dedicated and obsessed surf fishermen that you will ever meet. The tide is up, the wind is at our back, so let's hit the surf. So, Toby, uh, you know, last week on the podcast, we talked about fly fishing and even though we talked about the wetsuit, really what we were talking about was breaking down preconceived notions, and that was really more of the bigger theme. Uh, this week, we are going to completely knee-jerk the other direction. We are going to talk about something with potentially even more preconceived notions, uh, with a lot of judgment behind it, and people thinking they know, but actually they don't know. And that is the concept of chunking, and specifically, we are going to talk about active chunking. Uh, this has been something that, you know, some of our listeners know that you are doing and sort of known for. And so we've gotten some questions already through emails and messages and Instagram and stuff. So we're going to today go through a bit of the genesis, how this all sort of started. So, Toby, you are by far and away um, the expert on in the room, I'm air quoting people not watching, <laughs> about this. So I'm going to let you lead off with how this got started for you and sort of the method that got you, you know, to where you are today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, chunking, like I said, there's all these preconceived notions. And I had, I was right there with anybody like thinking it was this, it wasn't this. If I started chunking, I was going to do so much better. And I mean, that was that really what pushed me to it in the first place to try to figure out how to chunk mm. the surf is that, I mean, I had the conversation way too many times with the different people I was fishing over years. Like, dude, if we had bunker chunks right now, imagine what we'd be doing, whether it was on a night we were doing really well or on a night we were doing nothing. It was always in my mind and our minds that like, that was the, the, the magic bullet that we didn't have so i had to figure out but i mean a piece of the equation was getting the bunker in the first place i wasn't willing to like go with uh you know the frozen bait store bunker who knows how it was handled so it came about one year i stumbled across access from shore to bunker where i could go out and cast net it myself and use it literally within an hour of that stuff kicking and getting cut up from my bucket so it's like the opportunity presented itself after years of wanting to try something. So right away, I was like, all right, I had a bite at a location. I got Now I got bunker. Like, stuff is coming together. This is the perfect storm. And I originally actually was snagging versus now I'm using cast net to get them. So I, I think it was like either six or seven baits. And I was like, this is, this is it. I can't believe I got, you know, let's say six baits. Of course, now if I don't have 30, I'm not happy. But at the time, I didn't know any better. So I took my six baits, went to the spot, and I wasn't, I hadn't really come up with the the, the weightless side of it yet. So I'm doing like tra- more of a traditional chunking setup. And it was a location that like years ago I had chunked at. So I had a little bit of an idea. But even back then, you know, I was chunking with a wire leader and a big orange floaty to keep it up. <laughs> the bottom like i probably had a white bucket <laughs> nice <laughs> you know to, to round out that vision of what i was doing um nice so I, I go to the spot and like i said we had bass we had been doing well chunking or uh, plugging and i'm like Yo, we're gonna crush it chunking all i did was lose gear because i hadn't really thought it all through i was like i'm just gonna throw this chunk of bunker with a sinker and the bass are gonna just fight each other to get at it and instead it was just getting hung in rocks and it was just a nightmare but it was like it was good to have that so quickly kick me down because then i had to start rethinking things so the first thing i took out of the equation was the sinker like that was the simplest that i felt was causing the problems at this spot so then i went back to this spot with Basically now just a long, you know, leader, like an eel leader, essentially, you know, a long leader and a hook on the end and no weight. And I tried doing it and now it didn't work because now the current's going too strong and it's just, it's, I could see it like skipping on the surface, you know, it, it was not working, but I knew I still in my, my head, I knew there had to be something to it. 
I thought it through some more and I was trying to work it out some more, the concept in my head. And I, 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 you know, I forget exactly the sequence of where it came about, how many more times I tried it at that spot before I realized I needed to actually look at location differently. And it wasn't just a one-to-one -one that if I could catch plugging and I put bunker in its place that it would work. So it took me a little while. And, and uh, Jay, my fishing partner, he was really, like, we were doing it along the same time as well. Like, it, it kind of came together. We were both working on the pieces. You know, not just me. I don't want to <laughs> make it seem like I completely had that idea. Did you decide to do it together, though? Or was he sort of doing it separate and then you came together on it? So I remember... I can't remember for sure um, how we discussed it together, like before I, we actually started. I do know that that first night that was just hell that did not work. It was me and another fishing partner at the time. He wasn't, you know, Jay wasn't there that night. I, I know it was. It was sort of also early on when we were just getting to fishing together. So it, it's. I'm sure we talked it through and I don't, you know, I don't know who was like the first one, but you know, if nothing else, I was closer to accessing the bunker than he was at the time. So that might've played in a little more on me testing around with it. Um, but once a spot was sort of figured out that it worked, we were together on developing the technique. Okay. Um, so and my question is first off, when you, I mean, you said, oh, you know, it kind of came about, oh, we kept thinking, you know, if we only had bunker, we only had bunker, but you didn't really have that. You didn't really have an, any experience with the bunker in these spots. I mean, you said you had chunked a little bit. So what made you think that you would do better? Like, is it, was it because you had heard boat guys did better or because open sand beach? Like what made you think that you would do better? I think it comes down to like what we led with that these preconceived notions that, you know, chunking is easy, that it automatically gets you big fish it was like that was in my head that i mean heck if nothing else it's a natural food source i don't have to make <laughs> what i'm presenting look like something it's the actual something you know i'm not trying to make my super strike darter look like a bunker i'm making my piece of bunker look like a piece of bunker it already is so it, like i was probably oversimplifying it that it just should be better it should produce because yeah. it's the real thing it's their food yeah, well, so that's that's getting to my question because I find this I think this is interesting. So you were assuming, which now you know not to be the case at all, that if you could just throw a piece of meat out there, it would just automatically get fish. Like you didn't think oh, about yeah. like I'm just gonna throw this out there and I'm just gonna start hammering big fish. And I think it comes also like a piece of it is when I'm fishing. Obviously, we can't see into the water. You know, it's, uh, can't see through the water. Of course, it's dark. You can't see anything. So I start building a picture of what's in front of me, mm -hmm. and in that picture, if I'm fishing a spot, I've always got a vision of there being a lot of big fish there because I'm not going to bother fishing the spot unless I think that it's got the potential. So if I think it's got the potential, they're probably there. So I'm building this picture of there's bunker if they're not hitting or there's there's bass if they're not hitting my plugs. And they're there. If I give them the real thing, now I'm gonna produce the fish that were there all along. Like it's this weird, you know, thing that's going on in my head that it, it it just it felt like it had to happen. Like it was going to. And like I said, it's it's not. Did <laughs> it was you not that simple? Did you practice? My other question. <laughs> There's so many things to talk about, and I feel like I interrupted <laughs> you mid-story. But uh, were you practicing with the cast net before you saw them, where you could get them? Because you said you started snagging. So like where yes. did that where did the cast net even come in? So I I had a small cast net like a I don't know like an eight foot cast net um, just because like going to the beach you know during the day with I'd throw the cast net to see what was there just to kill time during the day you know go to Rhode Island with the family so I like I had a net and I'm, I was was and on that small one still horrendous at throwing it so when I found out there was a bunker accessible from shore. Um, the spot that I first had them did not lend itself to be able to throw a cast net. The, okay. There was like a whole bunch of re things behind it that really the only way to get them was with the snag hook. I mean, at times they were in close, but one of the reasons, one of the factors, they were too far, you know, outside of range to throw a cast net. So you had to snag them. Um, so it, it, that I always would bring them both. I'd have 
I'd have a bucket <laughs> to put them into. I'd have the bucket with the cast nut, and I'd have the snag, you know, the smaller rod with a snag on. I'd be trudging to my spot to get them, and it was always that snag hook early on until I, you know, just like I refined over time my fishing technique, I've now refined my bait gathering techniques, as you've seen when we've when I showed you how, yeah. how I was doing it there for the uh, English Journal article. Yeah. Um, but it was almost, it was, it was like it, that first spot where I was getting them necessitated the snagging to start with. Interesting. Interesting. So, so you, so you took off the weight. That's where we yeah. were at mid story. So you took off the weight <laughs> and yeah, cause I totally interrupted you. You, uh, you took off the weight and then yeah. what? And so then, so then what started to happen? It initially, it, it took some time You know, I'm trying to, it's been quite a few years now since I started doing it, but, uh, it took a little bit of time to get the feel, to really get it down that it, again, now I'm, I don't have the weight in the equation. So on the one hand, it's a positive because now I'm not just getting hung up in the bottom losing the rigs, but I still need to get the bait, that chunk of bunker down where the fish are, are hunting, feeding, moving. It's got to stay there long enough for them to find it. So, you know, like I said, with that first example, when I went back without weight, it didn't work because it was just flushing by with the current. So I almost had to like find spots where there were eddies and slower current and snaggy bottom just enough where it would kind of like hold up the bait as it was tumbling along. Like it couldn't be too gnarly where it would just fall in the rocks and get hidden and eaten by crabs and eels. It had to still be on the top. So it really was like, I remember I was obsessed with figuring out the, the pieces of that puzzle that could make it potentially work. You know, I was still working through that part of, of the whole system of um, where I could employ this, where I could put it stages of the tide, tide uh, uh, direction at, at certain places. You know, one of the places I go to it, it, it doesn't work right on one tide direction, but on the other, it, it's great. And that, you know, falls into those pieces of the current and the bottom structure and, and things like that. So I was still trying to figure those through, uh, and, and but I was working with a very basic tool in that it was, again, line to leader to hook to chunk. So like I got a lot of the pieces out and somewhere along the line, I remember, um, I, I even remember a night fishing with Jay where I'd get it hung. And like, at first I thought that was it that this weightless chunk, when I had it in its spot, don't let it move. Like the same concept of having the sinker on there holding in place. Now I've gotten it just to that magic little combo of not so gnarly that it can't be seen, but it's enough to hold it. And somehow I like moved it. And that's where this active part started coming in because I started catching. Now, whether, I don't know what it was, dumb luck that first time to start to build some of the confidence, but it, 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 it like really developed into, you get it in a spot and you hold it there for a while and then you move it a little bit and you're almost walking it like the slowest bucktail jig retrieve that takes <laughs> 12 to 15 minutes, you know, for fluke where you're on the bottom, you're moving along. Like that's almost what I was putting into it and how I kind of describe it now, but as I thought that through too, you get your bunker in its first spot and the current's coming by and it's pushing the scent out. Now you've got that cone of scent that goes out. If you move it, you know, 10 feet, let's say, Mm -hmm. now you've expanded your range of that cone of scent going out. Cause again, there's always the current involved in in the location. So it's, it's pushing out of this bigger net of potentially bringing the fish back in. And that was another thing I started thinking through that like as I'm moving it, like I don't wanna move it too much where it goes right across. You gotta like move it to a spot, put the scent trail, move it a little down, scent trail. And along the way, you hopefully will have a bass come along and intercept that scent trail and come to the bunker. Now, of course, no fish has told me this is what they're doing, but this is what I'm envisioning right. as part of that whole vision I've built in my head of there's there are fish in front of me. How do I get them in? all of this vast water to find my little chunk that's like the size of my fist. So, <laughs> so you know, part of the uh, interviewing and having a good podcast is pretending you don't know things. And, you know, I'm breaking down the fourth wall right now and uh, people are <laughs> seeing right through. So, I mean, I know a little bit about a lot of what you're talking about. 
But one of the things that I've never heard you say and what is burning in my mind right now is you went out to find Chunks and Bunker with the intent of sort of jamming them down the throat of the bass in your spots. But what it sounds like is that you came to find that chunking, while you do it in some of your same plugging spots, is really its own thing as well. That you shifted it from, oh, we could do better here, to, oh, I can use this tool to do better, but I need to change some of the spots, some of the parameters. Is that mm-hmm. is that right? Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's, just, it's another tool like... It's, it doesn't work perfectly all the time. It doesn't work better on sometimes. It's just another, you know, tool in the toolbox, like the fly fishing, like plugging, like jigging, whatever the thing, eeling, any of that. It's it's something I love to do. It's enjoyable, but it's something that at certain times excels, and at certain times it is not the best. But it's it's something I'm still working with learning, even after doing it now in this manner for. It's like 15 years, roughly, since I first started messing around with this whole concept. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it was early on, like part of what was kind of cool about it too is that I hadn't really heard any talk about it. I didn't know anything about this idea of weightless chunking. The closest, and actually some of the stuff I researched early on was what tuna guys do offshore. Mm. And how do they chunk a butterfish for yellowfin tuna in the canyons? And the knot that I used, the snell, came directly from that fishery. Mm. Because again, there was no like du- there was no direct editorial. There was no coverage. There were no articles. There were no books, no videos that I could find. But what I thought was really funny, you know, like no one talked about it. When I eventually did my first article on it, or it was either an article or first started talking about it. like when it first started coming out out of the woodwork i was like oh yeah we do that we've been doing that <laughs> that's our thing yeah that's nothing new and now sure you know just about everything that we do has been done in this manner or that but when i would hear that from someone you know some guy from another area is like oh that's how we we chunk that way i would then try to learn okay you know, help me lessen that learning curve and start prying and digging a little more. And like pretty quickly on, I realized that to a degree, what I was doing and what we were doing is vastly different than anything I was able to find anyone else doing. Yeah. Uh, and and it, 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 there was a bunch of guys sort of like right at the same time, like Jay and I were doing it. And I, I mean, I'd, I'd say there was probably five or six other guys in the same general areas that were doing it as well. Um, so kind of like, they were the only ones that eventually I was able to talk to and compare a little notes. But even at that, like we're all still competitive. So, you know, they weren't telling me everything. I sure as hell didn't tell them everything and little tricks and bits that I found. I mean, even the walking part of it, like the walking the chunk along that didn't come out first. That didn't come out early on. Like the only person that I told that to do was like Jay. (laughs) Try moving it. Yeah. 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 That's really interesting. So, So, Toby, this has been a really mind-blowing thing for me. And as we become friends, the things that you've sort of shared with me and the first time I heard you talk about this because of how how you broke down my preconceived notions as someone who did do a fair amount of fixed gear chunking where I'm, you know, in the rod holder half the time and, you know, with a pyramid. But one of the things that you really sold me on it was by talking about your expectations the expectations you have for a chunking night are insane. They're insane. And they're not the same as a plugging night. So mm-hmm. can you just tell everybody what you've told me when it comes to what you think is a good chunking night versus what you know might be considered a good night you know, elsewhere or doing something else? It's still it, like this, those, those original preconceived notions are still there, like to a degree, even though I've squashed 99.9% of them in practice. I still think, I mean, heck, last year I only chunked one night and there were so many nights where I was like, dude, if I just had chunks tonight and I didn't and still made do, et cetera. But I have this feeling that if I'm chunking, the potential of that next fish could literally not just be a 20 or a 30 pound, 
40, 50, 60, 70 pound fish. That's legitimately what, with every single chunk cast that I make, I, I, I feel could be at the end of the line. I mean, with, I, like even still, every time I put that chunk out there, I think this could be it where I break 80 in the surf. And not like just, oh, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm not trying to be funny and, and not like no. I legitimately feel the potential is there. And I don't, I still don't have that same feeling when I'm eeling, when I'm plugging. And what's even funnier, like to say the real world uh, uh, proof of it is the biggest bass I've ever taken on a chunk was like 49 pounds and change. So not even in the range of my biggest fish. Like plugs, the biggest fish I ever got was on a plug. <laughs> like on a jig, on an eel, like things other, other than that. So, but this it's still there. And, and I mean, an average night, a good night of chunking, when things go the way they should, is like those 20 to 28 pound fish are the rats, the schoolies, the ones you're trying to fish through. Then you get a couple of 30s, but it's really, I don't even, I don't even consider it a good night unless I break 40 pounds, honest 40 pound striped bass on the chunk. And that does not happen every night by any extent of the imagination. Um, I mean, there's years where I'll get, you know, four, five fish over 40 pounds and none of them have come on the chunk, but it's still always, it feels like it could be. There's just something that's still about the, there about it that that potential, I think, does remain. Yeah, and I think that was one of the things that really blew my mind when you were talking to me about it, is that, you know, a, a, you know, a plug night with 30-pound fish is great. It's fun. It's, you know, you're doing well. That's Those are bigger fish for sure. But if you're, you know, you're texting me and you're like, ah, I chunked. And I had, uh, it was okay. It wasn't really that great. And I'm like, oh, you know what it was? Decent. That's what I always decent. say. It was decent. It was decent. It was decent. <laughs> I had five fish over 35 pounds and I had, I don't know, eight or nine fish in the 20 pound range. And I dropped a bunch of fish and there was one fish that ran me off and I had the shark that scuffed my leader six feet up and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, that's decent. That's decent. <laughs> You're like, yeah, it's okay. And then, and then you know, you're like, oh, I had a good night. And, you know, I had multiple 40s or, you know, I had 12 fish over 35 pounds or, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. And it's, and you said to me, you know, I just have a different perspective because of the potential. And you really sold me on that potential. So I hope we've sold other people on the potential. But the thing is, Toby, there's tons and tons to talk about. Right, we haven't we, we we haven't mentioned the fact that you're using your van stall and spinning gear. We haven't mentioned mm -hmm. the fact that you're in your wetsuit. We haven't mentioned anything about the terminal tackle or you know how mobile you are or any of that stuff. So this was the genesis, and uh, we are going to potentially cover this a lot in the mm -hmm. upcoming season. And uh, you know, let's close this out, Toby. When do you think your first chunky night of the season is going to be? <laughs> Right after I find some accessible bunker from shore. When does that usually happen? Uh, it, it's happened in May. Some years it hasn't happened until August. Last year, it was June. I had one outing last year and it was in June. That was it. Cool. So we're going to bring this to people. Uh, lots of very interesting things. Maybe some performance metrics as they happen. Not in real time because... We're not giving you guys that information. <laughs> but I'm excited, Toby. I know you're excited, and I think that this is something really unique to you and something that will be then pretty unique to the Surfcast podcast, so we encourage everyone else to uh, follow along on this trip. This has been a weekly edition of the Surfcast podcast. You can find out more about the podcast and find more episodes at surfcastpodcast.com. Be sure to check us out on social media at the Surfcast Podcast.